Acts 8, 26 through 39. There you will find these words. Acts, the eighth chapter, 26 through 39. There you will find these words. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot to read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, And said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip uh, that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was, was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet? Is he speaking of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. Isn't that strange how they came to water, yet they were in the desert? And the eunuch said, See here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? I want to read 37 and 38 and 39. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both down to the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. But he went on his way rejoicing oh hallelujah god bless you god bless you he went on his way rejoicing i just want to use as a subject for just a little bit of your time an oasis in unlikely places an oasis in unlikely places my brothers and sisters, throughout history, different cultures have characterized masculinity in many different and sometimes unique ways. For many cultures, manhood was rooted in being a strong warrior, a strong soldier, or a strong hero which means they had to endure certain rites of passages to validate their manhood before the com community. In the Brazilian Amazon, young men belonging to the indigenous Mati Rari tribe marked their manhood upon their 13th birthday 
as they would undergo a painful rites of passages ritual called the bullet ant initiation. In this ritual, they would endure agonizing stings for over 10 minutes by venomous ants struggling to withhold tears in an effort not to cry because in their culture, crying indicates weakness while enduring the pain demonstrates that the boy is ready for manhood. My brothers and sisters, in the Vantu, a small island uh, in, it's a small island nation in the middle of the South Pacific. Young boys prove their manhood by jumping off 98 foot tall towers with vines tied to their ankles, demonstrating their defiance of fear through their context constitutes manliness. In our American culture, nevertheless, uh, sociological studies suggest that manhood is a sense of macho self-importance, a celebration of masculinity in regard to the size of a man's ego. Brothers and sisters, walk with me as I get to our text. The male species, my brothers and sisters, will go through great lengths to validate their masculinity. Men do some strange things, my brothers and sisters, to establish manhood. So brothers and sisters, so what I'm trying to share with you today that in, uh, in the context of manhood, masculinity is very important. Now let's look at the text. In contrast to what we feel masculinity is, something eerily is eerily different about this Ethiopian man in the text. For the text describes him as a eunuch. And I just want to pause parenthetically to, to raise a, a point of emphasis. It's strange, brothers and sisters, that many times people are defined or named by their shortcomings. I wish I had some help in here. It's strange how the man of our narrative is not called by his name. He's not even called the Ethiopian man, but he is called the eunuch. In this context, although a eunuch was the head of the treasurer, isn't brothers and sisters it is strange that when life you have a shortcoming in life people call you by your shortcoming the cripple the drunk the drug user the drug dealer the crackhead the jailbird they did not call him by his name, but they entitled him the eunuch. Now, to thoroughly understand what a eunuch really is, we have to become familiar with the ancient Assyrian and Ethiopian culture and custom. A eunuch is an Assyrian term meaning who, he who is head. Second to the king or the ruler, the text indicates in verse 27 that he was an Ethiopian, a eunuch of great authority. Brothers and sisters, he was second in charge under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. In other words, here is a portrait of a black man with money, power, and fame. He was a big boss. He was a baller. He was a shot caller. He was a head honcho. He was the top dog. He was living life high on the hog. Yet, if you look at the custom and the context, he was without that which defined manhood. 
As we continue to exegete this text, we discover that in Ethiopian culture, being second in charge to the queen was not all what it was cracked up to be. As a matter of fact, Candace was, uh, the Candace was a vicious woman. As a matter of fact, Candace was really not her name, but it was a title for an Ethiopian queen. It translated to Candate, and a Candate was known to castrate men who served up under them. I know this is not your usual shout sermon, but I'm trying to put a little... A little teaching in there with it. Many times we, uh, as, a, uh, as culture churches, brothers and sisters, we like the celebration without education. And God wants us to celebrate. He wants us to celebrate, but God also wants us to be educated. But my people perish for the lack of knowledge. So brothers and sisters, this man, although he was a head honcho, he was lacking something that most men had. Uh, brothers and sisters, they would castrate the men who served the women who being, uh, who, the women who were being groomed for royalty. They castrated and emasculated them but brothers and sisters, so that they could not mingle or intermingle with the women of royalty because in their eyes, the servants were not good enough to rendezvous with the women of royalty. Allow me to pause parenthetically to say, you have to watch being around and in association with people who, are only, who think you're only good enough for service and not fellowship. You have to watch being around people that only want you to serve but not fellowship. They call you when they need something. You can count them, but you can't count on them. Therefore, as we push forward into the text, a eunuch was physio physiologically psychologically, sociologically, my brothers and sisters, castrated. And they were castrated early enough in life that it caused significant hormonal consequences. Can you imagine a full-grown man with no facial hair? Can you imagine being a grown man with no mustache, beard, or goatee. He had perhaps a high-pitched tenor voice. Some brothers and sisters, uh, he, he was castrated often early enough for it to even affect his physical physique. He probably was grown with the body of a 15-year-old boy. In other words, what I'm sharing with you, brothers and sisters, he was a prominent man, but he had some private problems. He had some emotional problems. His ego was bruised. He was important but impotent. Because he was a eunuch, he perhaps was teased, harassed as a child, Wise cracks and insults as adults. And many people struggle all of their lives to overcome shortcomings that they didn't have anything to do with. Verse 27 says, Behold, an Ethiopian man, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. In other words, what I'm sharing with you is, brothers and sisters, despite of all of his shortcomings, despite of all of his problems, despite being laughed at, teased, 
and scorn, yet he still decided to make his way to Jerusalem to worship. I wonder how many of us, brothers and sisters, have been hurt in our lives? How many of us have impotent places in our lives? How many of us struggle with defective, imperfect failings and frailties in our lives? Those places that we struggle so vehemently to cover up those voids that keep us empty, but yet we still make our way. to the house of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this blesses me because there are a few things that I want to raise from the text. The first thing that this lesson teaches me that he searched diligently. And I just want to share with you today, brothers and sisters, whatever issue you are going through, whatever problem that you are having, I want to encourage you to search for the Lord diligently. Don't give up. Don't bag down. Keep pressing. Keep going. Because the word of God says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season... I wish I had just one or two witnesses in here. In due season, you will reap if you don't faint.